Desolation Sound is a wonderful cruising area, and officially it's it, this area, but for the sake of, of this talk, we're going to consider this whole area Desolation Sound. And like I mentioned earlier, warm salt water, beautiful scenery. Um, there are also a bunch of good lakes to swim in. It's a, a great place to take the family, um, very popular for uh, you know, multi-generational trips and and you see a lot of families out there and, and uh, easy to be active. There are hiking options, there are marina options. As you move north from Desolation, it gets more and more remote, but Desolation has this uh, pretty neat, sweet spot of good marinas to visit, lots of great, beautiful anchorages, uh, and that warm, swimmable water. It's also not all that far from the San Juan Islands, if you really think about it. It's 160 nautical miles from Anacortes. Um, so you can get up there pretty quickly. You know, in a lot of these newer rangers and cutwaters, with one day of good weather, you're in, in desolation. Um, so, so whereas in, for trawlers or kind of traditional trawlers or, or sailboats, desolation might be the culmination of, uh, of a week or more of cruising. And there's certainly enough to occupy you for a week between Seattle or, or the, the San Juans and, and desolation. Uh, you can cover this ground really quickly if you need to. A couple of challenges. Um, the garbage garbage situation is limited. Um, so you may want to try to get rid of as much garbage as you can before coming. And you might have to pay for, for garbage uh, when you do dispose of it. And then the marinas tend to be kind of smaller mom and pop type marinas. Prices tend to be a little higher. The season is short. Uh, so, so just understand that going in and you'll, you won't be in for any rude, rude surprises. Um, the stores may not have exactly what you're looking for. Uh, remember, we're, we're out kind of in the middle of nowhere. Most of, most of the stores in Desolation proper, uh, you know, that stuff's coming in by ferry or float plane or, or small boat. Uh, so so under, be understanding of that. Uh, and and be understanding of the higher than, than usual prices for some things. The first marina we're gonna talk about here is Gorge Harbor. And this is probably the, the, definitely among the best marinas in Desolation Sound. It's really a well done facility. Uh, you guys are gonna end your trip there. Um, they've got garbage, they've got fuel, gas, diesel, and propane. They've got a nice restaurant. There's pool, the pool to swim in, um, power, water, showers, laundry. I mean, this is, if, if you need something, uh, Gorge Harbor has it probably. So that's a great option, um, kind of the, one of the higher end options for the full service type of, of marina. And that's right here, very centrally located in Desolation Sound. Here's a, a picture of the facilities at Gorge Harbor. You can see a first class place. Plenty of room to anchor out there too, if you'd like. Just nearby, a few miles away, is Manson's Landing, and this is the opposite of uh, of Gorge Harbor. It's just a public dock with no amenities. There is a, a garbage drop; you have to pay a little bit, but not much. I believe the farmers market is is going to be operating this summer, but I don't know for sure. But it's a bit of a walk uh, up the hill from the dock uh, Friday afternoons. But double check on that farmers market. This is a picture of that uh, that public dock. And there's, this is notable, these red railings are indicative of Canadian public docks. And so if you see those red railings around, uh, that means the dock is, is probably a public dock. It's a first come first serve kind of place. Something like this yellow line here means it's probably reserved for loading, unloading, or some kind of a local boat. Otherwise it's, it's a first come first serve situation at most of these and rafting is required. So, uh, at most, that might vary between the docks, but but check on the the sign up at the top. Um, but you'll be expected if you get a spot on the dock, uh, go ahead and just put fenders out on the outside of your boat so that somebody else uh, can come ahead and, and tie up next to you if they need to. And similarly, if you're arriving and there's no space and you see somebody on their boat, feel free to ask uh, if if it's okay if you raft alongside. There's a little cooperation normally required with the rafting thing. Um, you got to get the fenders tweaked just right so that, that they're at the widest part of the boat. Um, and that's a little weird having somebody perhaps walking across your boat or walking across somebody else's boat. 
but it's a fun way to uh, to meet new people also and and um, be welcoming of, of other people during this the cruising experience. I found that that cruisers tend to be much more um, understanding and helpful than than more kind of normal life and so rafting is just just an extension of that um, but these docks are are small and limited in space and so um, sometimes we we've, we've got to work together to make a make us all fit similarly don't take up a, a bunch of space unnecessarily don't tie up your dinghy to a, a space on this dock behind your boat um, you know don't tie up 15 feet from the person in front of you or behind you uh, if you can avoid it try to try to tie up nice and tight so that the space can be maximized on these kind of docks typically these public docks don't have power or water but but some of them do and check on a case-by-case -case basis in the Wagner guide uh, for that and now just around the corner a little bit further is Squirrel Cove and that's a there's a public dock in there as well, uh, but I like anchoring there and dinging into the public dock. Um, and you can go to the restaurant. There's a pretty good store there. The restaurant's fun. It's always nice to uh, to get off the boat and have a meal out and let somebody else do the dishes during these kind of trips. Uh, and there is fuel available in here at Squirrel Cove. However, um, it is only available at higher tides. The, the fuel dock kind of dries at low tides. So check with the store who runs the fuel dock uh, about the tides and when you can get in there based on your draft if you need fuel. You can also go across the way to Refuge Cove uh, to get fuel. Here you start to get a taste though of the scenery in Desolation Sound. It's really very pretty, very mountainous. Um, this is the public dock. This is the fuel dock uh, that they run the hoses down to. So, so pretty minor, minor little dock. Here's the other side of that dock, uh, room for a few of the bigger boats. But you can see this is this is rafting. Um, hopefully the boats that are rafting are, are somewhat similar in size and type, that makes it a little bit easier. Sailboats, you know, rafting power boats on sailboats can be a, a challenge because sailboats are, are shaped kind of funny compared to power boats. Uh, so it can be hard to transition from say a swim step on a power boat uh, to somewhere on the sailboat. Just, just a little little tip to keep in mind. This is Squirrel Cove um, at the pub, restaurant, nice views. Right across the channel. So we were at Squirrel Cove. Now we're jumping across, across the Refuge Cove. And Refuge Cove is kind of the center of uh, a commercial desolation sound. It's, it's a charming kind of old timey feeling place. Very busy in peak season. They've got gas and diesel and propane. Pretty good groceries and liquor at the, the store, a little bit of power. Um, they have water most years that you can fill up on. Uh, there's also Dave's Garbage Barge out in the bay where you can pay to get rid of garbage. We hope that Dave gets rid of it responsibly. Um, there are also laundries and showers here, uh, which can be a, a welcome relief from boat facilities. So, uh, Here's a picture just of the, the general setup here. Here's Dave's garbage barge uh, and, and the docks. These docks can get full, but we found most boats don't spend the night. Mostly it's coming in, uh, grabbing supplies, having people fly in on Kenmore or fly out on Kenmore uh, and then continuing on. So th there's quite a bit of turnover at these docks. And I wouldn't, if you, if you get in there and you can't find a space, um, wait a little while or ask somebody when they're when they're leaving and um, it should all work itself out in not too long. Um, got a question about fuel quality and my own experience has been that the fuel quality has been consistently very good. Uh, have you guys had any problems on the, the, the group trips, ranger trips with this? I've never uh, I've never had any issues with fuel. I think the biggest thing is people are using quite a bit of fuel up there so it's getting cycled through quite a bit yeah for yeah. sure the other thing um sam is there is the float right you can't see it but right on the other side of the fuel dock mm -hmm. and uh and you can tie up out there and wait for a, a spot to open up at the main dock or you can dig yeah. in great there. tip yeah great tip and the other thing Thank that i found is uh is Dave's a little suspect on his pricing. 
He is weighing <laughs> your garbage now, but over at Squirrel Cove at the top of the dock, it's five dollars for a, a normal sized bag of garbage, whereas Dave might charge you ten or twenty if you're not careful. Yes. So, so I I use uh, Squirrel Cove as much as I can. <laughs> good, good tip. Thank you. You bet couple more questions we'll talk about roscoe bay on west redonda in just a few minutes that's an awesome anchorage um and then the voltage issues uh, generally the docks are 110 120 the the i've seen a few of these docks where you get, if you're at the end and it's cold and people are running electric heat um for instance the uh the voltage seems to sag by the the end of the dock but generally voltage is no problem Okay, uh, a couple more questions to answer. Uh, we're going to jump back a moment just to anchoring. Did you ever use a kellet given the limitation of how much road you can pay out? Um, a kellet is basically just a, a, a nautical term for a weight that you send down the, the line or attach the line so that um, it effectively acts like having more chain. I have not personally used a kellet, um, but I, I can't imagine it would hurt anything. It's just one more uh, step in the process. So uh, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily encourage it, but I certainly wouldn't discourage it either. Okay, um, this, this Humphrey Lodge, I only mention, uh, and I, I actually want to, I, I think that it probably should be removed from this presentation because it, um, they're really, they're, they're trying to get away from being a, a boat place now. They've, it's been sold and, and there are changes afoot. Uh, but it was a beautiful place, and you might have heard about it from friends who have been cruising in, in Desolation Sound. But look at what's happening in Humphrey Lodge, specifically um, as we get closer to summer, and call ahead of time to see if, if they're accommodating of cruisers. That This has switched back and forth several times recently. Um, but it's a beautiful spot up in Humphrey Channel. This is the, the lodge when it was still under construction. Um, the, the benefit there, they had had some water available. We, I just saw a question that came up about how, how broadly water is available. Um, and it's available at most of the marinas. Don't wash your boat with it. Um, ask permission before filling up. And, and that, that, but most of the time, get the, getting enough water to fill up your tank uh, at a lot of these marinas isn't, isn't too big of an issue, uh, although it can be. Toba Wilderness Marina, this is a, has really been upgraded in recent years. And they have um, have lots of water, good water, um, good hiking trails. Uh, so I think this is a, a and it's a beautiful spot. This is the the dock. So I highly recommend Toba Wilderness. They've got some some additional docks in there now, uh, but that gives you a sense of the view. So Kyle uh, is the gentleman who runs it with his family, and just make sure that you call him on VHF sixty six Alpha before you tie up. He uh, he sometimes if you just come in and and take a spot he can get a little bit grumpy. So um, tie up first and then, or call first uh, before tying up. They do have power in there. Uh, that was new in 2016, kind of kind of old news now, but uh, for a long time it was, it was pretty basic, but it's improved. This is the trail map. I've always liked the trail map on the, uh, on the shingle. And so now we're gonna talk about maybe uh, oh, five or six good anchorages. First one is Predo Haven, and this is the quintessential Desolation Sound anchorage. anchorage. It's huge, it's popular, um, it handles boats of all sizes. I mean, they're, they're 100, 200 foot boats that come in there at times. Um, if you anchor out in the middle, you typically don't need a stern tie. If you're anchored in, in the, along the edges, you, you probably do, um, just because it gets more crowded along the edges. Um, seeing a, a, a note, and this is true of any of the, the private marinas and desolation sound that reservations are recommended, but Toba, um, that's a particularly good idea to, to make reservations in at Toba. Here's some views in Predo Haven. This is a, a big ocean Alexander that tends to live up in Predo Haven for large chunks of time in the summer. And they, uh, the last several years have done big concerts, which are a lot of fun. Maybe I have a picture of it, maybe not. No. But big concerts where people come in uh, on their dinghy, they, they bring a band in, the band performs in the cockpit of the big yacht, uh, and 500 dinghies are rafted up all around here. It's quite fun. It's hopefully sometime in August. 
Um, I don't know any details of it this year yet, uh, but ask around uh, other cruisers and you may may find some information about this as it gets closer. It's, it's not a formal event. It's just kind of a, an informal, this guy does it for his friends and everybody else happens to be there. More Predo Haven pictures. What's your favorite Anchorage in Predo Haven? Um, hard to say. I like it out towards the entrance kind of, but, but all the way in, um, what is it? Is it Melanie, Melanie Cove or Laura Cove? Uh, hang on a second, I'm gonna. Yeah, I kind of I tend to like it near the entrance. Uh, Melanie Cove is is a little quieter, probably. You don't get as much traffic coming coming through. There's no bad anchorage, I'll I'll tell you that. Another favorite anchorage uh, is Tikern Arm, and this is one of the more difficult spots to anchor in Desolation. But there's uh you can anchor right here, and this was this is the kind of the the money spot. Um, you need to run a stern tie there, or you can you can see here, you can run a stern tie to that and be at a different angle. Um, downside here is you hear this waterfall all night long and you have to pee constantly. It's It can be kind of rough uh, <laughs> trying to get through the night. And it can be a little chilly too. You lose the sun early on, but it's a, a pretty special spot. Right around the corner is a dinghy dock. Um, and so you can also anchor uh, let's see, you can see some sailboats anchored in a slightly different position, uh, but you can come around to the dinghy dock um, and then hike up to the top of this bluff and to the lake that feeds this waterfall. Uh, and it's a wonderful place to go swimming. It's a really, really nice spot. Um, even if you don't spend the night because the anchoring is kind of difficult, it would be a nice spot to go in just for a few hours, go for a swim and continue on. Good stern tie. Uh, options here for lots of boats. They put uh, stern tie kind of eyes into the into the rocks and places. And this this place is T Kern Arm. Um, Pendrel Sound. This is a, a often the warmest water in Desolation. It's a, another lovely spot. Last year, somebody had a campfire there during a. a very dry spell and burned a lot of it. So it might be not quite as pretty as it once was, but that's to be determined. I haven't been up there since then. So uh, I'm sure the water will be as warm as ever, but that's a, a really nice spot. Somebody asked about um, Roscoe Bay. How warm is warm? Define, okay, uh, warm I think is in the, somewhere in the, the 70s, 80s, probably low 80s maybe by the by end of August. It depends a little bit on the summer um, and how much, how sunny and hot it's been. But warm enough that it doesn't, it definitely doesn't take your breath away when you jump in. Roscoe Bay uh, is right where I'm pointing with the cursor. Hopefully you can see it in the red dot. Um, that anchorage is a little bit of a challenge because you can only get in at higher water. So you can see this picture, kayakers coming in and out. Uh, you can see the rocks underwater. But at half tide or better, um, typically, you know, smaller boats don't have any problem. I would take a, a deeper draft boat in at high tide without any qualms. You can always anchor outside, um, kind of where this dinghy or boat is or whatever it is. Anchor out there, scope it out in your dinghy first or wait for the tide to, to, to come in and then go in. Here's a view inside, very secluded peaceful, a good lake for swimming at the head of the bay and a nice trail up this bluff somewhere. Um, you'll have to find the trailhead exactly. You can't really see it in this picture, but there's a trail off this direction that goes up to a lookout uh, several miles away. Another favorite anchorage is Von Donop Inlet. This has a really narrow entrance. It's, it's only shallow in one spot where a rock kind of chokes it off. Um, here you can see that. And so when you wanna leave this rock um, to port when entering and to starboard when leaving. Uh, this is all in the book and double check it in the book when you're going through there. Uh, here's a, a drone picture I showed. This is a boat that's exiting um, the rock somewhere about here. You can see you hug this shoreline pretty closely. Uh, boats of all sizes and types make it in there. So there's there's really no problem um, with draft. You just don't want to go over that rock that's in the middle there. 
once you're inside, there are tons of places to anchor. Um, and you can anchor, it extends beyond the, the screen here a little bit. You can anchor uh, uh, all the way anywhere through here. You can anchor it here. Uh, you can explore this by dinghy or kayak. There are lots of hiking trails. So it's a, a good playground to spend a few days. And you can also walk across from the head of Von Donop Inlet. There's a nice trail that goes over to um, Squirrel Cove, which we mentioned, Jeff mentioned the garbage there. Uh, you probably wouldn't want to walk over with your garbage. It'd be too long for that. But I like walking over for, for a beer or an ice cream or lunch or something like that. Um, good reward for a, a nice hike. It is a, a significant walk um, if you're not, not a, a used to walking you know, several miles over uneven, steeper terrain, then probably not the best idea. So the Discovery Islands aren't technically part of uh, Desolation Sound, but I think that they are, uh, for all intents and purposes, they might as well be. The challenge with the Discovery Islands, and that's kind of this area, is you have a bunch of tidal rapids that you have to deal with getting in or out uh, of the Discovery Islands. And so what this is hole in the wall up here. There's lower rapids. There's surge narrows. I mean, there's there's a bunch of these these different rapids um, depending on what specific route you you use to get here. Uh, a lot of the timing for these rapids is not in the Ports and Passes book directly. Um, you won't be able to look it up. And you'll have to look up a secondary, which is going to be Seymour Narrows, and then use your your arithmetic skills to to calculate. Um, at the end of the book, you've got offsets. So there's the secondary currents. And so it might say on a turn to flood, you have to subtract one hour and 39 minutes from the time uh, at Seymour Narrows to come up with a time for this other pass. Um, that whole process is kind of at the end of ports and passes. And, and there's a tutorial, and I encourage you to read through the tutorial on how to use ports and passes in the book uh, and, and ask any additional questions. Uh, either by email or uh, text me afterwards, and we can go through it. But do be aware of these rapids. These rapids are not like uh, they're not like Deception Pass that I spoke, of, you know, and, and that we spoke about that you can cheat. These rapids, you you need to be pretty careful. These are rapids that flow 14 uh, knots, sometimes 15 knots, and can have big standing waves. So so make sure you're pretty close to slack uh, at these rapids. But these are some of the places uh, that you get rewarded by. The Octopus Islands are, are definitely a favorite. Um, they're a highlight. They're, they're really, really beautiful. And there are lots of, of um, little anchorages that you can find kind of for one or two boats through here as well. So Campbell River over here is kind of the, uh, the biggest town in the area. And they have everything. It's a significant town. Um, they've got good marinas. They've got help um, if you need any any boat repairs done. They've got a fuel dock. They've got a big, like, honestly, the biggest grocery store I think I've ever seen in my life, um, right across from the Discovery Harbor Marina. And so Campbell River, if you're going to be up in Desolation Sound for any length of time, a uh, really good spot to, to end up at some point for resupplying. Now, if you're coming from the north, I say you're in the Octopus Islands, which are right here, you have a couple options. You can come up through rapids here, uh, out here and then through Seymour Narrows, uh, another rapid. That's a little bit of a challenging trip because you can have, uh, you got to hit slack at both places, which can, can be difficult uh, on one tidal exchange. Or you could come down this way, go through one of the rapids down here, uh, and then come around Cape Mudge and come into Campbell River. The challenge with that is only when it's blowing from the south, and then you get uh, pretty ugly weather around Cape Mudge, like I spoke about earlier. Otherwise, um, generally speaking, this is going to be a, a pretty nice run most uh, summer weather is from the northwest, and you're going to have a pretty easy trip over into Campbell River. Do be aware of, of five, six knots of current that run through here. Um, not You don't have the current at the dock, but you have it coming into the marinas. And yeah, you've got all the, the services you need here. This is a, a, a picture of Campbell River. This is Discovery Harbor Marina. And that's the, the facility that I would recommend staying at in, in Campbell River. They've got the fuel dock right there, super close to groceries. They're good restaurants right at the top of the dock. Um, so you can do everything within, there's a good chandlery there uh, and boat yard as well. So everything with just a few steps um, from the dock and it's a, a very convenient spot when you're in desolation for the, the reprovisioning and whatnot. 
All right, I think we're gonna now dive into getting home uh, and customs. Those are two different presentations, but interrelated. Uh, and then no, uh, no discussion of what to do next is complete without talking about the options uh, for continuing north. And there's a lot north of Desolation Sound. You've got the, uh, even before the Broughtons, there's the whole area um, kind of inside of all the rapids that are north of Desolation, but south of the rapids. Uh, Shoal Bay and Dent Island and, and places like that. Um, and then you get through Johnstone Strait and you get into the Broughton, which is a whole nother cruising area, um, and on and on and on, all the way up to uh, Alaska. But what you can typically expect, uh, at least initially, is a bunch more rapids, um, a little bit more wildlife, uh, quite a bit cooler temperatures and more rain, and fewer boats and fewer services. So it just gets more and more remote. Uh, and the people that are out tend to be out for longer periods of time. Uh, not many people that are out for a week or two make it beyond Desolation Sound. It's just too far. Uh, but people that are in the Broughtons, I would say the average, average Broughtons cruiser is probably out uh, for upwards of a month and, and sometimes much more. So um, not, I wouldn't say one is inherently better or worse than the other. It's just a, uh, a different, different experience in each place. And, um, enjoy desolation. If you're feeling like it's, it's too small or you want to see something else, you can, can continue on. Ah, the, a fun question. Does a Yeti cooler work that much better than a regular cooler? To, um, I, I have not used a Yeti cooler myself. I'm frightened by the, uh, the cost. Other people may be able to um, elaborate on that more than I can, but the, uh, I would Google it and see. I think there are other coolers that are sim perhaps similarly functional and lower cost, but uh, they definitely. I think the Yetis definitely work better than the the old igloo. You want me to take this one, Andrew? Well, you're the wrong person because I think Kenny <laughs> sock and Yeti. Um, but yeah, you can you can explain. Yeah, the hands down, the Yeti is the way to go. For. Uh, <laughs> For, for even any of the drinkware and stuff on the boats, um, it's nice. I mean, I think Andrew and I both have a couple uh, Yetis for coffee and rum and Coke and that kind of stuff. Um, but the, the 45 is nice just because they'll fit on the uh, swim steps. And then if you have a, an outboard, they, uh, they do fit underneath the center hatch very nice as well. And I think, I think you have the 45 as well, don't you, Andrew? Yeah, and you know, other people are talking about you know different coolers that are less expensive, and I'm I'm sure there's other ones that you're you're definitely buying the name, but they were kind of the first ones to come out that were really insulated that would last you know keep ice for a long time. But I'm sure there's other ones out there too. Oh yeah, we just happen to have a few Yeti products. Might be a little subpar to the Yeti, but. Uh, <laughs> The good thing is the others can't uh, talk right now, so they can't argue this. So it's just Yeti or nothing, basically. Right. Pretty much Yeti or nothing. Yep. Yeah. I, Makes sense. I know some people, ice is pretty widely available at any store, so you can, can top up. Um, also, don't, don't be, uh, if you've got friends on a lot of large boats, larger boats, um, not, not my own, but a lot of people have... Uh, have ice makers on board and so sometimes people are those make a ton of ice and people are I've seen a lot of people throwing away the ice that's not quite perfect anymore and so you might be able to, to bum ice off of other people at times um, and even I know friends with it they keep most of their perishables in the Yeti and they just use a rotate a few freezer blocks out of the little freezer compartment um, on the you know the like the under counter freezer fridge freezer combo um, just freeze a bunch of, freeze some ice packs and, and rotate those through the Yeti to keep the Yeti cool without having to get ice all the time. All right. Um, some of you may or may not want to have uh, friends and family visit while you're up there, or you might need to leave the boat and come home for whatever reason. And float planes are plentiful, easy, and fun. Um, they, Kenmore makes it really easy, and Northwest Seaplanes um, I mean, you can be from Desolation to, to downtown Seattle in um, less time than it takes to get from downtown Seattle to Anacortes on most uh, afternoons. And so 
the, the seaplanes are by far the easiest way uh, to get back and forth, but they're also expensive. And so a good alternative um, or a decent alternative is to drive, have, have friends or family drive up. Uh, and they can drive up to Lund or Campbell River and, and get on the boat in one of those places. And so that makes it uh, a lot cheaper, but a lot more time consuming to get up there. So eventually we gotta, we gotta come home as, as sad as that is. Uh, and since, since the plan I think is for you guys to head up on the Vancouver Island side, we're gonna talk about coming home on the Sunshine Coast side. Uh, we're gonna talk about diverting into to Princess Louisa Inlet perhaps, uh, and Jervis Inlet, Howe Sound where Vancouver is, and then continuing the rest of the way home. So this mainland side of the coast is called the Sunshine Coast. And it's a beautiful, beautiful area. You've got Powell River Westview right about here, got Pender Harbor right about here, uh, and then you've got Gibsons and, and Vancouver down here. Lund up at the north end is the end of the road. Uh, there's a boat launch and, and I know people who trailer up there uh, all the, and, and launch there and they don't then have to deal with any of the hassles of um, the Strait of Georgia and the weather uncertainty. However, you've got to uh, deal with a bunch of ferries and it's not inexpensive to trailer a boat onto uh, the BC ferries. There's good moorage for small boats, smaller boats. Um, and that, that's probably, you know, 40 feet and under or so, um, 45 feet and under in Lund. It gets crowded in the summer and so it can get pretty tight for, for space for bigger boats. Um, I wouldn't say Lund is typically a, a destination in and of itself. It's more of a stop along the way. Uh, but they've got got good prices for gas and diesel, a, a really pretty good grocery grocery selection. Um, you can fill up the, the water, dump the sewage. They've got power and showers and laundry and all that kind of stuff. And my personal favorite are the, the cinnamon rolls at Nancy's Bakery. Uh, I'm partial to the apple cinnamon rolls, but but you should go there and, and decide for yourself which the, the best are. This is a, a picture around Lund. A little further south, uh, from Lund is Westview, Powell River. These are two municipalities, but uh, functionally the same. If it's windy and you're seeking refuge, uh, be cautious coming into Westview, uh, Powell River. Those docks uh, tend to have, they're kind of at a weird angle and it can be a little challenging to get, get into the, the docks there when the wind's really howling. Um, so just a heads up on that. It's also a long walk uh, from the moorage into town, but they do have, uh, have fuel, water, power, all that kind of stuff. Um, my preference would be of, of Lund, Westview Powell River, and Pender Harbor. Um, I would go to Lund or Pender Harbor over, over Powell River. Pender Harbor is a, a pretty cool spot um, right down here. There are a bunch of interconnecting bays in there. There are several different marinas to stay at. Um, you can also anchor out if you'd prefer. John Henry's is, is the best uh, marina right now. They've got a store and fuel as well, uh, but the Garden Bay Marina and Pub are open, or should be open this summer, we think. Um, and then there's a public dock, which is less expensive and closest to the supermarket over in Madeira Park. And if you look in your Wagner guide, um, you'll see the, the details uh, of Pender Harbor in, in more clarity. What we typically do is anchor out um, or, or tie up um, at John Henry's and then we take the dinghy over to the supermarket if we need more, uh, more kind of full provisions at the supermarket. This is John Henry's, the fuel dock uh, with the, the moorage docks in the distance. A little bit further inland here, um, we have Egmont. Uh, and Egmont has the Back Eddy Marina, which is a, a really good uh, marina option. They've got all the usual amenities, but do be careful of the current of the dock. And there are two, two kind of claims to fame for Egmont uh, or, or reasons to visit. One, it's a really good jumping off point for heading up to Princess Louisa Inlet, which is up here. And it's about 40 miles up um, and 40 miles back. So you want to make sure you're fully fueled and, and got plenty of water before you, you head up that way. And Egmont is the last stop for that. Egmont is also a, a place where you can hike to Skookumchuck Rapids. And Skookumchuck Rapids is one of the fastest flowing tidal rapids in the world. Uh, Velocity is at, at you know, 18 knots or so at their peak. And that's because all this water um, back here 
in Seashell Inlet has to flow through Seashell Rapids, Skookumchuck Rapids. Um, so this is, a, this is just a picture of the area. This is a picture of the tidal rapids. So when, when we say you can cheat deception pass um, because it only runs to nine knots and smooth, um, yeah, that, that's not a big deal. This one runs to 18 knots and it's not smooth. This is, a, this is serious water. Um, you don't want to be here at the wrong time in your boat. This looks like a river to me. It, the sound of it is incredible. Um, you can walk out from the marina as maybe a couple mile walk uh, to see this at peak. And it's worth doing because you will uh, learn to respect tidal rapids in a way that you can't merely from, from pictures and video. Um, these crazy people in the whitewater kayaks have a blast playing in these standing waves. So from Egmont down here up to Princess Louisa Inlet, about 35 miles, an incredibly beautiful run up the inlet. Um, just gets more and more dramatic with every turn. The scenery is stunning. Um, it's like mountains rising right out of, of the ocean. Lots of waterfalls in the early summer. The challenge here is that you must transit Malibu Rapids near Slack. Uh, and that is one of the tidal rapids. It's kind of a dog leg. Um, it's narrow. And, and you want to be going through there near Slack. This camp um, is a Young Life camp, Malibu camp. Um, it's, it's situated right at the rapid. So the rapids are Slack in this picture. You don't see any flow, really. And there's a swimming pool down here. It's a beautiful spot. Um, typically, the way it works, slack is a busy time in the summer at Malibu Rapids because there are a bunch of people that are, are hanging out there uh, waiting to get through. And so typically, all the traffic goes in one direction and all the traffic in the other direction. Um, there's time for everybody to get through, so don't be, be too rushed. Don't go powering through. And then once you get on the inside of Malibu Rapids, go no wake speed all the way to the dock um, or the, where you're going to anchor or tie up to a mooring buoy. The, the wakes bounce off the wall in the fjord, and it can be really uncomfortable uh, for people to dock if you're coming in and throwing a wake. This is what not to do at Malibu Rapids. I don't know how this, this boat ended up sideways uh, and then stranded as the tide dropped, but, but uh, this was about a 170-foot yacht many years ago, uh, the Golden Cell, I believe, that ended up aground and blocking Malibu Rapids. So. Please go at Slack and wait your turn. And this is why we go. Um, this is Chatterbox Falls, the falls at the head of um, Princess Louisa Inlet. This is uh, the, a picture of the dock, just breathtaking scenery. There are campsites there as well if you have too many people for the boat um, and you want people to, to stay on shore, kayakers come in too. Uh, more scenery in this area. Uh, Bruce was mentioning that the, the West Coast Wilderness Lodge, I'm going to go back a few slides because he's right, the West Coast Wilderness Lodge, this is it, has a stunning view and you can eat on this deck. Um, so you might be able to get a ride up there or you can walk up there, um, but look that up while you're, while you're in Egmont. And I think uh, that this side trip up Princess Louisa is, is exceptionally worthwhile. I mean, I can't emphasize enough how stunning the, the natural beauty is as you head up uh, Princess Louisa Inlet. It's a must see. So we're going to continue further south. Uh, there's really no reason. I showed you those pictures of Skookumchuck and we talked about hiking out there. For most cruisers, there's no reason to go in into Skookumchuck uh, Rapids. There's just not much for the cruiser in Seashell Inlet. So we're going to come back down here and we're going to skip by Pender Harbor and we're going to go down to Secret Cove, which is um, a good spot to duck out of the weather if Strait of George is not cooperating or to wait for better weather. Um, they've got a restaurant. Here's their, their floating restaurant on the top floor, a store on the bottom floor. Um, and then they've got all the, the usual amenities as well. So uh, Secret Cove is a good spot. And then you're kind of out in the strait. Um, for a little while. Either you're going to cross back to the Gulf Islands and work your way through here, or perhaps continue down the strait into Howe Sound. And Howe Sound is where Vancouver is. 
And Vancouver is a lovely city to visit by boat. Um, we're going to skip Gibbs, Gibson's because it's hard to visit by boat now. I'm, I apologize, this red dot is incorrectly placed, but there's a, a Keats Island over here. They're near Gibson's. There's Plumper Cove Marine Park, and that's a really nice marine park. Um, here's a picture of, of how sounded Plumper, the docks at Plumper Cove. So um, that's a pretty spot if you end up in Howe Sound. More pictures of the dock, good hiking there, good docks. You can actually take your boat all the way up to Squamish. So if you've been to Whistler, you've driven along the Sea to Sky Highway, um, which runs all along here. Uh, well, you can take your boat halfway to Whistler. So that's a beautiful trip. Moorage is limited and it can get pretty windy up there. Uh, but if you're if you're a skier at all, it's a pretty novel thing being able to um, go up there and get a ride up to Whistler and, and go skiing on the same day that you're on your boat uh, on the glacier up at Whistler in the summer. Um, a, a uniquely Northwest activity. A picture of somewhere up in, um, in Howe Sound. This is leaving Squamish. And an excellent marina in this area is uh, Union Steamship Marina in, in uh, Snug Cove. This is a picture of it. This ferry runs across to uh, the mainland, but a really top of the line marina, um, very friendly staff, lots, to, um, lots of amenities there. I think Vancouver uh, is a, a great city to visit by boat. Um, there are a couple of good, lots of good marina options, either Coal Harbor or you, several marinas in False Creek, or with a free permit, you can anchor um, right in False Creek. It's a naturally beautiful city. Um, when you're anchored in False Creek, you might recognize these aqua buses that go around. Well, you can just anchor, um, you know, post your permit, and this process for getting the permits outlined in the Wagner Guide. Uh, post your permit in your window and, and take your dinghy to any of the docks that the aqua bus stops at. Uh, tie up your dinghy and you can just go explore the city. And so you can dinghy right down to Granville Island, which has um, you know, superb market stalls. Some of the best restaurants anywhere um, are, are in Vancouver and, and you can walk to a lot of those. Uh, so really a, a totally different experience than Desolation Sound or Points North. Um, but an urban boating experience that is, is very cool nonetheless. Here's the, the Granville Island market. Then if you're, you're down in Howe Sound, the Vancouver area, uh, and you're trying to come home, uh, presumably you're, you're coming back to the US, the temptation is to just pop down uh, through the Strait of Georgia. But I mentioned earlier, this area, Sandheads off the Fraser River, is, is really uh, known to be some of the worst weather in the Strait. Uh, not always, but it can be. And so I would recommend crossing back over to the Gulf Islands, um, coming down through the Gulf Islands where it's relatively protected through the San Juan Islands uh, and then back in into Seattle or wherever your, uh, your launch point was uh, on the more protected route. This is supposed to be pleasure boating and, and uh, unless it's really calm, there's little reason I see to, to be out in more exposed areas um, and, and potentially beating yourself up a little bit. So I'm gonna uh, talk now a little bit about US customs. And this process is um, slightly specific to Washington state. If you go up to Alaska, it's a little bit different, but uh, for the purposes of this, this discussion, it should be, should be good. And again, like the Canadian one, we're gonna assume that you're not taking any commercial goods and that you're not using Nexus or another trusted traveler program. Um, because of the Rome app, we basically, I need to describe two almost entirely different processes. And so this Rome app is really slick and you should go uh, look it up right now in the app store while I'm talking, download it. And then when this afternoon or, or next week or whatever, start filling in the information. And so you'll open up the app and you'll have to fill in information about your boat, about your, the people who are gonna be on board. So, so birth dates, passports, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then you're done for a while. All you do is when you're coming back into the US, um, you wait till you've crossed the border and you open up that app. They know if you've crossed the border because it's tied into the, the GPS in your phone. Once you've crossed the border, open up the app, go through the process on the app, um, just answer the questions that it prompts you and continue. Now, at that point, you'll either be uh, cleared in immediately uh, or almost immediately and given a clearance number. Uh, they'll give you a text confirmation and, a, and an email confirmation. 
or you'll be asked to do a video call, um, or you'll be asked to divert into a customs port of entry. Um, I've never been asked to, the, to divert to the customs port of entry. I have been asked to do the video call. And during the video call, they asked me to walk around and show them. Um, they, I think they wanted to see a little bit around the boat to make sure that there was nobody else on board. Um, and they also wanted me to show them the inside of my refrigerator. So don't think you can smuggle those, uh, those perishables across just because you're, you're gonna use the app. Um, they still are, are checking and, and it'd be a bummer to get caught uh, because you thought you could get them across. So that's the, 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 the uh, short version of how to use the Roam app. Uh, basically you download it, fill out the stuff in advance and then follow the prompts. If you're doing it the traditional way, you're gonna come to one of these five places. Um, the most common being Fri Roche Harbor, Friday Harbor, and Anacortes probably. Um, most of these have a designated customs dock. Um, Anacortes does not, and Port Angeles does not, but Port Point Roberts, Roche Harbor, and Friday Harbor have designated customs docks. Uh, during the season, these customs docks uh, are out at the breakwater at Roche Harbor and Friday Harbor. There are big signs that point to them or point between them. They want you to tie up between those signs. Um, so they'll have, they'll have big arrows that point towards the middle. Um, so tie up between those signs and then walk up to the customs office. The Canadian experience had you uh, on a phone at most of these. The US experience is typically in person. And so what you'll, will, you'll usually do um, is you're gonna walk up to the customs office. Uh, again, the captain's the only one allowed off the boat. Um, the crew can, can get off to help tie up the boat, but um, the captain's gonna take all the documents. It's gonna be the same documents you had going into Canada uh, with the addition of your clearance number. They usually like to see that Canadian clearance number. And the, uh, you're gonna take those up to the customs dock, uh, customs shack, it looks something like this, so customs office, and you're gonna wait in line and do exactly what you're told. They're gonna ask you the usual questions. Um, are you bringing anything back? Uh, you know, has anyone been on the boat without you, um, et cetera, et cetera. Here's one thing that you're gonna have to deal with um, that might be unique and new, and because you don't have to deal with this crossing by car or commercial airplane, is this decal. $27.50 for the year. Um, only US flagged vessels need this. So if you're a Canadian, don't get this. Um, you've got a different process, which I'll talk about in a moment. But you can go to this uh, URL here and you can buy the decal. If you're not a US flagged vessel, if you're Canadian in this case, this is the cruising license and this is for non-US flagged license, uh, vessels. So when you get in, you won't do this in advance, you'll get in, you will um, go up to the customs dock with your passport and, and you know boat registration information and so forth. Uh, and you'll buy for $19 US a cruising license that's good for one year. I don't know off the top of my head, I can't remember if that's a calendar year or a, a, a rolling year from when you started. But anyway, you'll, um, you'll buy that and they'll give you some further instructions. And so you as a Canadian cruising in the US will be required to check in periodically with customs. Um, I don't know the details of how frequently that is, but they will tell you when and where you're supposed to be checking in with them while you're cruising in Puget Sound. Um, it's not a, a particularly onerous requirement um, and it's fairly new, but it is something to be aware of. They'll just want you to phone in every so often and say, hey, I made it to Everett or hey, I made it to, to Seattle or whatever. Um, I'm gonna answer a couple of questions here. If no matter if you're using Rome or not, you need to have that customs decal. Um, and you will have to enter that number, that customs decal number that you get into the Rome app to clear customs. So you don't get any free lunch by using the Rome app. Um, if you have Nexus, you can still use the Rome app um, or you can phone into the Nexus number like you always have. It's totally your choice. But if you're a Nexus holder, but you have somebody on the boat that does not have Nexus, 
um, then I would highly recommend using the row map because you probably will be able to clear without going into um, a specific customs doc. Um, the cut, cut water 28 question, I would, I would err on the side of, um, you know, if, probably don't need it. You probably just, you know, walk in there. They'll ask you if it's over 30 feet. If, you know, unless they say that it's, it's over 30 feet um, on some paperwork, they're not going to come out and measure. And so I would, and the worst thing they do is make you pay, um, you know, 2750 at the time. So, so there's a pretty, they're not going to, they're not going to, you're not going to be in any trouble if you don't have um, that, that decal when you're coming across the border. But you may, it may make you, if you're using the app and hoping to, to bypass a customs dock, they may divert you into a customs dock just to buy the, the decal. So if you can, do it in advance, um, do it right now, and then you just don't have to worry about it. Um, 30 feet, I believe, is the overall length. We've, we've batted this around extensively in previous years to, to no uh, real conclusion. So uh, I'll leave it up to you individually to figure out the, um, the length. If, if, you want, if you're the type that wants to ensure you won't have a problem, buy the decal in advance. If you're the type that wants to save the 2750, um, wait till, till the day of and there's a chance you won't have to buy it and there's a chance you will. Uh, and to answer the question about US flagged, um, that, that for the purposes of this decal, it's either uh, US, it's either US documented or, or um, Washington registered or state registered. Any U.S. boat, basically, if you're a um, if you're a, a, a U.S. citizen cruising back to the U.S. with a U.S. boat, you need to have have that um, that decal. So we're going to continue on. Hey Sam, am I screen sharing now? Yes. Perfect. So what documents do you need when you're coming back to the US? Um, same things pretty much that you needed when you were going into Canada. The US is less concerned though about the, uh, the, the minors traveling uh, with one parent or grandparents. They don't seem to, to be generally too concerned. Um, they do want you to have a rabies certificate, but cats apparently don't need one just for dogs. Um, you know, flowers and plants are gonna be a problem again coming back. A lot of produce is problematic coming across the border. So again, we, uh, I try to avoid carrying it and just give it away to, to somebody in Canada or, or um, leave, it on the, leave it on the dock on the, the north side or call specifically a few days in advance with, um, with your questions. Say, hey, I've got this, this and that still in the boat. What should I eat before I come back into the US? I think we've... We've dealt with this. Um, sheep and lamb are problematic. Sometimes it's helpful to keep your, if you've come from the US with food, keep it in its original packaging because if you can prove, you know, if you have a receipt and a, a package that shows it's from the US, they might let it back into the US. Rosemary, thank you for the heads up on the uh, cruising license experience that you had. We, uh, that what were, she said is that the, it was good for a, a year from the date of issue and no further need to check in as they cruise throughout um, the United States. That's really encouraging because they, um, that's changed. That's, that's changed a bit over, uh, over time. And then, okay. Alcohol, they never seem to be concerned about coming back into the US. Um, there is a limit, but I, I personally never been asked and I, um, I wouldn't worry about it. I just declare it if you're, if you're over uh, and they ask. The tobacco thing that gets people fouled up is, um, Cuban cigars and the, the rules about Cuban products coming across the border have been shifting as well. And so that's a bit of a moving target, but if you definitely 
want to avoid any hassle, um, don't bring any Cuban cigars or Cuban rum from Canada back into the United States. That's been relaxed and then tightened and then relaxed. And uh, I, don't, I don't know what the status of it is um, exactly this summer. There are duty-free limits. They almost always ask you if you've bought things in Canada. Um, and so if you're there for just a couple of days, you're limited to $200 a person, uh, $800 a person for more than, than 48 hours. Um, realistically, these don't seem to be a big problem for cruisers. They don't seem to care if, you know, if you've bought fuel or food, household items like that, uh, it's not a big deal. It's more things that you're, you're trying to import um, for whatever reason. So, you know, if you were buying a bunch of expensive clothing or jewelry while you're in Vancouver, um, that kind of thing. And, and as always, if in doubt, declare it. Um, you don't want to be caught in a lie with customs, either US or Canadian. They really, um, they don't look kindly upon that and they can make your day and, and future transits quite miserable. So uh, being honest and forthright with them will serve you well in the long term. So if you have any questions at all, I'll be around here for a while, um, you know, the next little bit and happy to answer questions. You can also call, email, text, um, whatever, and, and we're happy to, to answer uh, any questions you might have uh, about this information. And uh, thank you so much for listening. And I hope, uh, I hope that this was worthwhile and you, you got some good information out of it. Oh, great, great job, Sam. It's always in very informative and I enjoy it each year and we appreciate you taking the time to carve it out to do it for us. Well, thanks for having me, Jeff. You bet. Yep. Thank you, Sam. It looks like we got a few questions coming in here. Yeah, I'll run through, through some of these. So storage ideas um, and other people may chime in with, with even better storage ideas. Um, getting rid of as much packaging ahead of time is good finding storage containers that fit in the odd spaces that we have on boats can be a challenge. Um, friends are using for like bedding and clothing increasingly those kind of, um, there's, they're like sacks that you put a, a portable vacuum in, you suck all the air out. And so those mm -hmm. are great because then clothing doesn't get wet or other bedding, you know, doesn't get wet. Um, it takes up a fraction of the space it normally does. If you have something like a little handheld Dyson, you can repackage it on the boat. And so that's a, a, a nice option. Any other great storage tips? Well, I think your, your tips on uh, packaging is really important. We, we use that. Um, and really just getting in your boat and, and uh, just trying different things, different little storage containers that kind of contain things that you can easily slide in and out of their spaces. Uh, you just, you learn what works for each person, each boat. Mm -hmm. There's one I'm just looking from uh, Steve about average speed on the trip. And for us going up, we just, we try to break it up into two groups. And basically one is, uh, is a little bit of a faster group. And then if uh, we have some that like to cruise slower, then we can even go into three groups, but anywhere from I would say 10 knots to 25 knots, depending on the boat. So a question about flag etiquette. Uh, and it, my feeling on this is you can either choose to fly no flags or both when you're in Canada, you should fly both the US and the Canadian flag. I think the, the offensive situation is when you have a US flag, you're in Canada and you're not flying a Canadian courtesy flag. Um, but I've heard I've heard various things for flag etiquette. I think the, the courtesy flag should be on either a starboard antenna or spreader or on the bow staff if you don't have anything off the bow staff. But that bow staff location is a little touchy on um, you know some real sticklers for traditional flag etiquette. Um, so you might have, I've gotten emails from people who said that the, they saw a boat with a, a courtesy flag on the bow and they said, chastised us on the flotilla for allowing somebody to do such a thing. But, um, I think if you've got an American flag off the, the you know, as your, your primary off the um, kind of transom or something and a Canadian, Canadian courtesy flag, starboard spreader antenna, you're all set. And vice versa if you're a Canadian traveling in the U.S. 
Yeah, Bruce has a good idea with the uh, box wine versus uh, carrying bottles of wine. Uh, it takes up less space and certainly uh, have less uh, waste to get rid of. Yep, and and true of also of um, canned beer versus bottled beer. Cans are so easy to deal with compared to bottles. Uh, <laughs> I was asking how much beer for I Andrew. See, yeah, I see the one from Tara. Uh, <laughs> Andrew, the Tara, lots Tara, of beer. Tara has uh, plenty of room on that new boat, and she knows that it's going to require a lot of beer. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, and if, if it, people uh, can keep the guys fed on the way up because they have a tendency to, to get working and, and not eat properly, I, I'd appreciate it because I won't be on, I'll join you on the trip uh, part way, but uh, keeping them fed I, is important. So thank you. There's, there's no known food allergies either. So just yep. want to throw that out there. <laughs> yep. We're pretty uh, strict on our diet, uh, peanut butter and jelly tortilla wraps. So that's, yeah, that's a classic. Nice, nice to mix it up a little bit. I was asking about global entry. I don't think global entry helps with, uh, with boats. Does anybody have any input on that? I think there's a place on the Rome app to put it in, put your number in. So it can't hurt coming into the U.S., but it, it won't help going into Canada at all. Yeah. Does a U.S. vessel need a decal if using Rome? Do we yeah. answer If that? it's over 28 feet. Yeah. Or I mean, I'm sorry, 28. <laughs> if it's over 30. If it's over 30. I think it's it might be $30.50 now for the decal. Yeah, apparently I, somebody said it's gone up a little bit. I, but, I haven't uh, bought and I can tell you it's, uh, it is worth uh, just getting that. Uh, as you said, Sam, I, I've been hassled over it before and it just adds time. So for the little bit of money, rather than uh, play with it, it's better to just get it done. They're more Any? concerned about getting money for the decal than they are uh, yep. uh, what citrus you have on board. So. Yeah. <laughs> Anything you can do to make it seem like you're really trying to follow all their rules and be kind and, and courteous to them? makes the process a lot easier. Uh, any other questions? So information on the on slow boat, if you want to get the information about weather, go, no go, that's um, under the webinars tab. So if you look at webinars and you look at any of these gates, you can find, find more information about that. Also feel free to email me directly about that. Um, and I'm happy to point you in, in any direction or, or spend time with you individually. Uh, learning more about that. And uh, I, Andrew, who knows? Yeah. Andrew's nickname is definitely Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the, that's the nickname, but uh, I don't know if he's saying nickname or the boat name. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Anchor alarms. Good question about anchor alarms. And that's one of those things that uh, personal preference. I've used anchor alarms uh, at times in the past, and I found them to, to give false alarms more often than not. Uh, personally, I'm not a super heavy sleeper. I wake up um, normally if there's a big change in wind or something, I hear the waves slapping against the boat, the bergy flapping. I get up and I check and, and it's all fine. So I've not been a big anchor alarm fan, but, but I'm sure the Garmin allow, there's an anchor alarm functionality. And most of, uh, most of the, the, there are several options on the phones as well for doing anchor alarms. Well, we're getting a lot of nice comments about the presentation and, you know, thank you guys for uh, participating in it with us. And it, I think it went pretty smoothly for our first go around. Yep, I agree. Thank you everyone for watching it. And thanks again, Sam. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, I, I normally go upstairs for a beer, but I'll, I'll have one. I'll have one for you anyway. Yeah. <laughs> we'll All do right, the guys, same. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, thank, you, and, and, right. thank you, and thank you. Feel free to uh, yeah contact me with any questions you might have. All right, thanks, Sam. Thanks, thank guys. guys. Take care. Enjoy the okay. sunshine. All right. Bye. Talk to you later.